for you in the racks of the chairs right in front of you. So open your Bibles to Genesis. It's right at the beginning. And so uh, just open up, if you will, to chapter 11. Chapter 11. Good to have all the young people here tonight. We have vacation Bible school tomorrow. So over here is the blue team. And over here is the red team. Tomorrow they'll get to be on those teams. So I ought to have a blue team and a red team for church tonight. Have a little competition. Sydney, are you talking? No. No, oh, I thought that was you talking. No, it was Kevin, was wasn't it? <laughs> okay. All right, Genesis. Genesis chapter 11 tonight. Genesis is origins, beginning. And we've looked and seen many origins, but we have been tracing our line from our, our the, the time period that we've been looking at Genesis. We have been seeing where God's plan to redeem mankind has come to fruition. We've seen how it's come. Uh, in just casual conversation on a constant basis, when you talk to people, many folks have the idea that the earth has just gone on and on for millions and millions of years. And it's interesting that, that uh, that's not so and hasn't been thought to be so until the last couple hundred of years. Uh, truthfully, we've always known every generation from the first man until now. And so we've only seen a really just over a thousand years have taken place thus far, and God has judged the earth around 1,500 years after the first man was born. Of course, Adam died in, what was he, 900s. So Noah would have been, would have known his grandfather would have been a contemporary with Adam. So, Madison, I'm going to take my keys from you if you don't quit talking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, the Noah, before he went on the ark, his generation had known Adam. Now, uh, we're going to see, though, where the promise of the Redeemer came from. It's important to understand in every generation that God's plan is mercy. And every time period that God has ever worked, the common thread that you always find is the thread of mercy. And so recently we have seen the formation of this group of people that God is going to bless by using them to give his Savior. We saw, or to give his Son, who is our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we saw, last week we saw the curse that was on Canaan. One of the things that we came to understand was that Canaan identified with his father Ham's sin. Made a willful decision to identify himself with his father and his father's sin. It's interesting that the curse that Noah, because of the uh, because of the disrespect and the dishonor and the wickedness that his son Ham had portrayed toward him. It's interesting that, that uh, Noah didn't curse Ham. He cursed his son. Uh, I'm sorry, he didn't, yeah, he didn't curse Ham. He cursed his son Canaan. And that helps us to understand the question that people have asked through ages and even accused God of being unjust because of. It answers the question, why is it that God gave the land of Canaan to the descendants of Shem? Well, it's because of the curse of Canaan and the willful decision to identify themselves with that sin. Uh, Canaan was cursed, and it was a known curse. All of mankind knew that Canaan and his generations were cursed. When you're part of a cursed generation, guess what you ought to do? You ought to disassociate yourself from it. See, what Canaan, Canaan should have done when his father Ham committed a wicked sin, was he would have said, you know, that was my dad. I don't want anything to do with that. I, I, I disown my father. I am not having anything to do with his sin. One of the things we saw last Sunday night is that typically individuals are more loyal to their wicked relatives than they are to God. Of course, there are many individuals who will say, you know what, I don't want to receive Jesus because my family won't receive Jesus. I don't want to go to heaven because my family's not going to heaven. And literally what they're saying is, I'd rather go to hell than accept God's love. I'd rather go to hell and identify myself with my family than go to heaven and identify myself with Christ's love. Friend, I want to remind you of something. You'll never, you'll never save your family by going to hell with them. You'll never reach your family by going into sin with them. And the same is true of your friends. Many individuals think, well, if I separate myself from my friends, if I separate myself from my family, and if I join myself to Christ, and if I follow Jesus Christ, well then that will drive a wedge between myself and my family and friends. Uh, you need to be reminded, if you think that, that the only hope your family and friends have is to know somebody who has come to Jesus Christ. 
to know somebody who will share Jesus Christ with them, who will point them to Jesus. Because that is the only hope that they have. What good is it going to do your friends on a sinking ship if you get on the ship with them? They need somebody on the ship that floats. They need somebody that is not sinking to identify with. And boy, we make that mistake a lot of times. I see Christian families do the same oftentimes. Right? And you'll see a man and he's desirous to follow the Lord Jesus with his life. Or the opposite, you'll see a woman who's desirous to follow the Lord Jesus, but their spouse is not, uh, is not so. And, is, and they're, they're not in a situation where their spouse wants to follow Jesus. You know what happens as a result of that? Oftentimes, the one who uh, knows that they should follow the Lord Jesus goes with the one who is against God and who doesn't want to serve the Lord. And the consequence of it is that their children are raised not in the church. Their children are raised not uh, knowing Christ, not knowing spiritual things, not having a relationship with God. God, but rather instead they're raised following the one who is going away from God. And that's a tragedy, isn't it? It's too bad. And so one of the principles that we have seen so far in every instance where you find this curse or you find individuals who have, like uh, Cain, who had sinned, and now he has a grandson who committed the same sin that he had, is that their descendants follow after. Then we find the sons of God and the daughters of men get together. And guess what? The sons of God... Do not get closer uh, to, I mean, the sons of God do not get closer to God or bring the daughters of men closer by identifying with these wicked women, but rather instead, the whole, the whole, all of earth uh, just becomes completely wicked with the exception of one man, Noah. Folks, we can't play with sin. Listen, you, you can't trifle with sin. You can't make a decision, well, it's going to work out for me. It's never worked out for anybody else throughout history, but it will for me. Everything will turn out well. Listen, God's merciful. We know that, don't we? We understand God's merciful. We understand God forgives. He's a God of second, third, fourth, multiple chances. He's a God who, as long as you're living and you have breath, gives you the opportunity to repent and to come to a right relationship with Him. God loves you. And He's extremely merciful. And the reason, the very reason uh, that you're alive today is because God's merciful and because He wants you now, today, to have fellowship with Him. Well, now we find a different time period has come and explains some things, and we always have a lot of questions. And this, has, this is an important passage of Scripture uh, for a number of reasons, but namely because it helps us to understand that there's only one race. There's only one race, and this is a passage of Scripture where we understand where a lot of the divisions that caused genetic differences within races or caused ethnic, ethnic division within races to come about. But we know that God only created one man, one race. By the way, if anyone ought to understand that there's only one race, it ought to be Christians. If anyone ought to understand that there's only family, one family, it ought to be believers in Christ. I like to look over a crowd like we have here this evening. Somebody asked me the other day, they called me, they were doing a survey, and they said, oh, what primarily is the ethnicity of your church? And I say, we're mixed. We're everything in our church. Why? Well, because our community's mixed, and that's the way it ought to be. Hey, listen, shame on believers who would go to a white church. Shame on believers who would go to a black church. Shame on believers who would go to a Hispanic church when we're all one in Christ. Hey, there's not differences. The Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, but the same Lord over all is rich unto all them who call upon Him. I don't, it bothers me, racial ministry. I'm a little bit bothered when someone says, I'm going to reach this ethnic group of people. That's racial. That's racism. Hey, go preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're one. We're made one. If you read in Acts and you find when the gospel went to Antioch and the church became a Gentile church and they were mixed from all around the world, they were called Christians first at Antioch. And Christians, my friend, ought to be the most diversified group of people ethnically that you could possibly find. But, but as, far as, our, as far as our culture goes, we ought to be the most unified. You know, I believe in Christian culture. I believe in Christian culture. I don't believe uh, that, you know, I, I understand you go to different places in the world and because of the food that grows and because of the climates and so forth, the food's different. And I like to eat different kind of cuisine, different kinds of food. But listen, uh, I don't like different kinds of culture. I've heard people say, well, a missionary shouldn't go to the field and try to change the culture and Americanize it. I agree. 
Hey, listen, I, it bothers me when the poor folks from other country and you, you, you go visit another country and you see the folks there wearing pop culture American t-shirts. And you see, boy, they're in American culture. And guess what? That's a wicked culture the American culture is. You know the culture of every nation under the sun is a wicked culture because it's of the world and not of Jesus Christ. But Christians have their own culture, you see, because it's modeled after the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the same everywhere you go. It's agape culture. It's the kind of culture where there's brotherly love. Where uh, when you come into the church house and you're a child of God, you're one of the family and you belong there and uh, you have a biblical-based culture. You behave one toward another. As the Bible says, Christians ought to behave one toward another. Hey, hey, you know, well, we just don't have a friendly culture. Not inside the church house, my friend. The church house has a friendship culture. Uh, well, we just, you know, we're just naturally this way or that way. We just put aside what we naturally are because we're born again. We're regenerated in Jesus Christ. And so that's a big uh, uh, introduction to Genesis chapter 11. Now let's just look at some facts. You guys ready for some facts? Look in your Bibles. You're in Genesis chapter 11. Here we go. Verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now this is an advertisement for folks that live in the plains. I'm from Kansas myself, and people just don't understand the plains people. You know, hey, listen, why get where you can fall down and hurt yourself anyway? I don't understand that. That's dangerous. Stay in the plains. Stay in the areas uh, where things are, you know, nice and safe and you can see what's around you. <laughs> Kansas really isn't that flat. But everybody thinks it is, so you might as well make jokes about it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, it came to pass as they uh, journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So they found a good place, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now the idea here, I have heard many people say, well these people are trying to get to God. They're trying to reach God. Well, I understand that before Babel there was probably great technological capability, but these guys are building with brick and slime here. And uh, so uh, let's don't get too silly about that belief, if you will. Those folks didn't know where heaven any more, more than, was any more than you do. Did you know that? They didn't know where heaven was. Hey, where's heaven? You know where it's at geographically? It's a geographical location. If you knew where it was, yeah, it's north. North from where? Uh, the Indians, uh, they, they think it's up the... Uh, well, I don't put much stock in what the Indians think. Where's it at? <laughs> the sides of the, uh, the north. North from where? Here. Um, our north. The north of our north. North from Jerusalem. Everything's north mm -hmm. from Jerusalem. So, okay, so heaven's north. Where at north? Do you know it's a geographical location, and if you possess the capability to travel and go there, it's a real place that you really could go to, but uh, nobody's ever been able to do it because it's way too far. And these folks, I'm not under the impression that these individuals had figured out where God was and how to get to him, them. Notice the text here tonight. Look at it, if you will, with me, please. They said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. So the idea of heaven is, is the outer, outer earth, the outer atmosphere. So it's a high tower, but here's what they really wanted to do. It says, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The idea here of not wanting to be scattered, the idea of making a name for themselves, of unifying themselves, is the same idea of what was happening before the flood. It's an idea of getting together to band themselves together in wickedness. The, there's a concept of we want to be unified in this, we want to be together in this, and essentially together always is for the purpose of being against. The purpose of unity, the purpose of getting together, why, do, why is it a good thing for individuals to band together? Well, because they can be more protected against something. You see a herd of animals, why would animals herd up? Well, because they're buds. Well, watch them fight sometime and see if they stay together because they're friends. I'll tell you why they herd up. They herd up for protection. Because there's more protection in numbers. Well, who in the world are the inhabitants of the earth protecting themselves against? Dinosaurs? Well, I'm sure dinosaurs would snatch children every now and again, but that's probably not what was going on. Who are they protecting themselves against? God. God. Against God. 
And this is a rebellion against God. This is the nations of the world saying, we don't want God, we don't need God, our intellect is better than God, or whatever their argument was. And it's, a, it's interesting that that's all the time the Scripture gives, just a quick statement. God doesn't give any kind of rebellion very much time. He just says it was rebellion. He doesn't say, well, here are the specific acts they did. They built a tower that represented their unity against God. That's what the tower was. It was their religion. It was their worship. It was whatever it was, specifically because it was against God. And that was the whole point. And that's the point of anything that is opposed to God. That's the point of anything that isn't worship of God. When you determine that you're not going to worship God, you'll worship something or someone or yourself, but you won't worship God. And you'll, you'll find individuals to band together with and unify yourself with because that's the rebellious character and nature of our hearts. Well, there is much speculation. There's a lot of that people write about this, but it's all speculation and writing. And so you could read about it if you want to and learn some interesting things about the origins of, of uh, world religions. And here's where, where we really find origins of many uh, idolatrous worships and practices come back. They all come back uh, to this Tower of Babel. It is interesting, isn't it, that ancient cultures have a record of times when the languages were confounded or changed, as the Bible says. It's interesting that ancient cultures, for instance, Chinese cultures, some of the Chinese cultures have a record of when the languages were confounded, and more than that, of when the earth was destroyed by a worldwide flood. Why? Because it's a historical fact. Now, those things throughout time, as they've been passed on, have the accounts of them have been made less and less accurate, but we have the most accurate account in the world because we have the Word of God. And this Amen. book is explaining to us, Genesis in particular is explaining to us, how we got <coughs> Jesus. How we got Jesus Christ. Why? Because that is the climax of all creation. Listen, the Bible teaches that before man ever sinned, before the foundation of the world, that God had a plan for redemption for all of mankind. Before man ever sinned, God had a plan to redeem man to himself. And God wants all men to come to him. Now here's what God did. You guys ready for this? Everybody in the world got together and they got themselves a nation. They built themselves a tower. They became unified. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And the idea of, you know, that God is not saying, Now I can't stop them anymore. I don't know what to do because these people are now so powerful. The idea is that there is nothing that will stop these people from just gratifying themselves any way they feel. There's no restraint on mankind. So that isn't, well, I'm out of control. I now, now that I can't control things anymore, uh, I'm going to have to do something before things get out of hand. God's never been out of control. Never been out of control. He's never been helpless. He's never been concerned that somehow individuals are going to vaunt themselves against Him and somehow succeed in attacking Him or rebelling against Him. There, there, there was no way that they could overcome the sin curse. There's no way that they could uh, find a fountain of youth and live perpetually or do something that would, would uh, defy the curse that happened when man sinned, which caused all men to die. Now, so here's what God said, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. So uh, here they are, and they're going to establish a world religion, and it's going to be against God. That's what all religion is. That isn't worshiping God, it's just against God. You say, Pastor, you've got to understand there's some really good people and there's some really good religions. No, there aren't. There are not. Any, anyone who worships anything other than God knows in their heart that they're not worshiping God. I defy you to prove that to be otherwise. It isn't so. Anyone who worships anything other than God knows that what they worship is not God. And you know in your heart, and so you know it's true for you, you know it's true for everyone else. We're not all made differently. God made us to worship Him. When we worship anything else, then we worship other than the truth. And we make a choice of our worship, and ultimately we're worshiping ourselves and not God and not even that thing because we've chosen to replace God with something else. And God wasn't going to allow them, the world to be unified in a rebellious religion. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And so from here 
forward, we find that the languages of the world, the people of the world, were separated on the basis of the language in which they spoke. Now, my assumption, I don't know all the facts of this because I wasn't there and no one else that I know of was there, uh, no one that's contemporary to me was there, but I suppose that the languages were changed within the families. I suppose that each family probably had their own language and they just separated themselves on the basis of their language. It's interesting um, how good people who like each other separate over language just in a fellowship kind of a setting. For instance, last night we were all at McDonald's after teen activity, and there were a few folks that spoke uh, pretty much mostly Spanish only. And because they only spoke Spanish, uh, they weren't unfriendly toward anyone else, but they naturally gravitated to those who spoke Spanish. Why? Well, because it was a lot easier for them than learning to speak English in the short time that we had together last night, and so it just made sense to do that. And the same was true with Babel. Uh, God confounded their language and made it so that in individuals only heard one language. Now, let me just make a comment that will just get you thinking and, and maybe get you irritated if you disagree with me, and that's just for fun. <laughs> the... Um, we, following this text, we find that Shem, we find the line of Shem down to Abram. And of course, we know that Abram or Avram is going to be the father of Isaac and of Ishmael. And he's going to be the one that is the first in a line of individuals that God said is going to be your generations that produce the one in whom all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And so we find, we trace Abraham down from the descendants of Shem. Shem, of course, is where we get our word Semite or Semitic, and of course those would be the individuals that uh, would be of the people group from which came Israel, which would have been God's people, the Jews, be later on called the Jews, but the descendants of Jacob, which would be Israel. And uh, they spoke Hebrew, and uh, perhaps some Aramaic. And it's interesting that in the New Testament, during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, we find that God's economy, once more, again, is with the Jews, is with His people, the Jews. And God's going to restore His people, the nation of Israel. And the nation, the, the national language for Israel will be Hebrew. There's no question in my mind about it. Incidentally, uh, the Hebrew language has been greatly revived in the past, oh, I don't know how many years, but it is uh, becoming stronger and stronger and, and actually going back, I believe, to more of a... Um, uh, a solid grammar, grammatical form, and it'll be the language of the millennial kingdom, and so probably it'll be the language that is spoken in heaven, most likely, because there will be individuals who don't die. Who don't die, they'll be taken to heaven, and that's the economy they'll be in. I know it's not a problem for God to just make us all speak one language, but I think the language in heaven will be Hebrew. And so I recommend that you start practicing. Maybe get yourself some vowel charts and some alphabets and start learning Hebrew if you're planning on going to heaven as I am. Incidentally, everyone can go to heaven. I want to just conclude tonight by saying to you, it's important that you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Uh, God has made it possible. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants you to be His child. He wants to save you. He wants to redeem you to Himself. And so you could, you could be His child this evening by simply understanding one truth, or a couple of truths that are all related, the first of which is that we're all sinners. If you don't think you're a sinner, all you need to do is ask someone who knows you, and they'll explain to you. Uh, they'll not only tell you that you're a sinner, but they'll give you reasons why they know for a fact that you are. That's a, that's a common sense fact, but some folks have denied it because they are not willing to look at themselves uh, with accurate eyes. They're, they want to think of themselves other than they are. But when you come to God, He knows who you are, and so you've got to be who you are uh, because God's the one who will judge you for what you are. And so the Bible says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The Bible also says the wages of sin is death. And so every one of us, because of our sin, is going to receive the wages. That was we saw original sin, and we saw what happened to the original man when he sinned. Adam's not with us anymore, and the reason is because he sinned. We're of his, uh, we're of his genetic code. We're, we're descendants of Adam, and it's natural for us to sin. We're a sin-cursed race, and so we're no exception to it. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so God's desire through Jesus and what He has made possible because of the blood of Christ is for all of us to be restored to Him or made alive. How do we do that? How do we receive it? Well, the second part of that first verse, the gift of God's eternal life, 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus came to this earth and He lived without sin. And yet He died because of sin. He didn't die because of sin He committed. He died because God credited Him or uh, placed our sins on Him and He was crucified on the cross. But He didn't just die on the cross. Hey, we can, we can find forgiveness partly because Jesus died not for His sins but for our sins. Jesus died for my sin. But He didn't just die for my sin. And He also was buried and rose again. And when Jesus rose again, friend, He made it possible for you and I to be risen again from the grave. And so He took our place. Well, the Bible teaches very plainly that, that it's God's will that everyone should not perish, but it, that all should come to repentance. And it, that God has made it possible by grace for all to be saved. But the question is, is everyone who was ever born going to heaven? Is everyone in the world going to heaven? Or we can more accurately ask the question, does everyone in the world want to go to heaven? And I'll submit to you the difference between people who go to heaven and people who go to hell are, is the want-to factor. Listen, if you want to go to hell, God will not resist you. If you make a decision, you say, you know what, I want to reject Jesus Christ. I want to reject God's plan. I do not want to receive Jesus as my Savior. God will allow you, my friend, to go to hell. But if you want to be saved, you can simply ask God for the gift of eternal life. You can pray and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. And that's just a fact. God, I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And you can turn toward Jesus Christ in repentance and say, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want to be your child. And I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did. And God will take what you have done and He will credit to Jesus Christ. Take your sin place it on the cross of Jesus. He'll take the righteous blood of Jesus and He'll cover you and cleanse you. And that's a Bible promise. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's a promise to you. And no one here this evening has to go to hell. Everyone here this evening can be God's child and can be on their way to heaven before we ever leave this room this evening. If you don't have confidence of your salvation this evening, if you don't know that you're on your way to heaven, would you please, would you please, uh, after we dismiss tonight, would you just, just say, when I, when I talk to you, when we, uh, if we have a conversation, would you say, hey, I'd just like to know that I'm going to heaven. I want to make sure I'm on my way to heaven. And you can leave here this evening knowing 100% for sure from what the Bible says, from God's, God's Word, that you know that you're on your way to heaven. Let's pray and we'll dismiss. Father, thank you tonight for the, what you've taught us from your word. Lord, we need to know these origins. We need to understand these truths. And I just ask that you would speak to our hearts about them. Help us to think biblically as a result of it. And Lord, we thank you for this record that you've given. We don't have to wonder where we've come from. You tell us where, you came, where we came from. You breathed into man, into dust, uh, and, and you made man a living soul. And God, we thank you for making us living souls and making us have the ability to have a relationship with you. Lord, I rejoice in my salvation. I rejoice in Jesus Christ, my Savior. And I ask that it would be possible for everyone that's under the sound of her voice this evening to be able to do the same. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.